It's time for our discussion of competition and monopoly. <clears throat> now, when I was uh, studying economics uh, back in school many years ago, when, when we discussed issues related to monopoly and how competitive markets are, a lot of that discussion was sort of backward looking. We talked a lot about John D. Rockefeller and uh, Andrew Carnegie and Cornelius Vanderbilt and the so-called robber barons of the 19th century, early 20th century. But it was thought that markets had become much more competitive since then. Oh no, monopoly is back uh, with a vengeance. So uh, uh, Senator Warren, for example, has made one of her key, so one of her uh, you know, primary, uh, uh, primary part of her platform in her election campaign is that big tech companies Amazon, Google, Facebook, and so forth have become too large and need to be broken up through aggressive sort of antitrust policy. Even you know the Trump, even Trump's uh, Department of Justice uh, has already started uh, a new set of investigations of uh, market concentration and abuse of monopoly power, particularly by tech companies. You know, if you're not sure how all this works, you can always find a convenient explainer on Vox.com. So you can, uh, Matthew Iglesias will be happy to Vox-splain for you everything that's going on. But it's a little bit weird if you think about, uh, think about these issues from sort of a common sense perspective, right? I mean, what do we mean by competition in everyday language? Um, I don't know if any of you were able to, to watch it uh, with travel and so forth, but on Sunday morning, uh, uh, Roger Federer and uh, Novak Djokovic played an epic Wimbledon men's final match. Uh, it was five hours and something, the longest men's final in Wimbledon history, and the first one ever to use the uh, a new rule that they instituted this year of having a tiebreaker in the fifth set if it gets to 12-12. So they got to 12 games each in the fifth set before playing this uh, a tiebreaker. And uh, Federer, who is, what, 37, uh, hung in there till the very end and lost uh, by a hair to Novak Djokovic. And we would say, commentators did say, this is one of the most competitive men's finals ever. This is a great example of sporting competition. What a fantastic competition between Federer and Djokovic, and in the semifinals, Federer beat his longtime rival, Rafael Nadal, in another epic match. But how many competitors are in these tennis matches? Two. What do your professors tell you about a market in which there are two competitors? <laughs> yeah, it's a duopoly, right? It's not competitive at all. Uh, we normally think competition means, you know, an effort to beat somebody to do better than your rival. You know, in school, you're competing against other kids or you enter the spelling bee, it's a competition. You're in the band competition or a sporting competition. Uh, we sometimes use the adjective form to describe a competition that is particularly intense, right? That was a really competitive match. It was really close. You know, to get into college, the college of your choice, you've got to pass a really competitive entrance exam or whatever. Obviously, you know, this is uh, um, not the way these terms are used in mainstream economics textbooks. Now, legally, right, the, uh, in, in, in common law systems, there was an understanding of monopoly. In, in the natural law tradition, to use uh, Judge Napolitano's uh, terminology from last night, that, you know, a monopoly was an exclusive grant of privilege that was conveyed by the ruler, by the king, uh, by the sovereign, right? So, you know, the, the, the Dutch East India Company had a monopoly on trade between Amsterdam and the East Indies. What that meant is it was illegal for anyone else other than the Dutch East India Company to sail ships around to Indonesia or whatever it is and bring back cinnamon and nutmeg. You know, uh, the, the Royal Navy would fire upon you and sink you. You'd, you'd, be, you'd be thrown in jail, your goods confiscated if you attempted to do that. And sometimes even today, if you buy, uh, you know, you buy some, I don't know, you're, if you go to, go to London on a school trip and you buy some little cookies or biscuits uh, at the gift shop and it says on the back, you know, her royal, by order of Her Royal Highness officially licensed, you know, shortbread to the queen or something like that. 
right? So that's what monopoly traditionally meant. It means you don't have to compete with other firms or producers or as many other firms or producers because the state has made it illegal for someone else to compete with you. Oh no, not in mainstream economics, right? In neoclassical economics, we have a whole different kind of language to describe competition, models of so-called perfect and imperfect competition. Uh, the definition of competition in these uh, models has to do with essentially the ability of firms to charge prices that are higher than their marginal costs for reasons that we'll see in just a moment. Um, the Austrian school, not surprisingly, takes a different approach or has taken some different approaches to the understanding and definitions of competition and monopoly than the neoclassical economists, and I'll explain in just a moment what those are as well. Okay, so in your, in your undergraduate economics textbooks, you probably have chapters on competitive markets and non-competitive markets or imperfectly competitive markets. And the idea here is it's kind of an empirical exercise, right? So we, we look at a particular market in a particular place, say, you know, the market for toothpaste in Auburn, Alabama. And we say, okay, what kind of products are sold? Is there kind of a generic toothpaste or the, and there are lots of different firms selling essentially what are sub perfect substitutes? Or is it a market with differentiated products where a tube of Crest is completely different from a tube of Colgate or whatever, in which, e in which case each firm has a monopoly on its own brand, right? Uh, are there lots and lots of buyers and sellers or are there just a few buyers or just a few sellers? Uh, how easy is it for a new company to get into the market? Not only looking at the issue of legal privilege, like we mentioned before, but even if it's just economically difficult to get in, right? I mean, there's no law that prevents me from setting up an online retail uh, uh, business and trying to compete with Amazon, but I'm not going to do very well, at least not at first, and probably not at all if I'm just selling general purpose goods. So uh, mainstream economists would say, well, th th there's, uh, Amazon's existing size and brand penetration constitutes an entry barrier. And so new, com new firms can't come in, and therefore that market's not competitive. You know, what do people know? Is there perfect information, asymmetric, asymmetric information, and so forth? So you know, that's why your textbooks say, well, the wheat market is pretty competitive or almost perfectly competitive because wheat is just wheat. You don't care which farm it came from. Uh, there are lots and lots of sellers of wheat. Um, uh, there are no particular entry barriers to getting into wheat. Uh, of course, none of that is actually true, right? There are lots of different kinds of wheat. There are different grades of wheat. And of course, nowadays, there's organic wheat and GMO-free wheat and wheat made with sustainable farms paying a living wage. There's all different kinds of wheat, so it's not even true. But your textbooks use like agricultural commodity markets as examples of things that are sort of close to perfect competition. Or you could have a market like the market for large body commercial aviation, which is where there are basically just two firms, Airbus and Boeing. There are some smaller firms of the, the firms that make the little jets like Embraer and so forth that are starting to build bigger ones. But for, you know, wide body planes, really there's just two firms. Or in a market like the market for internet search, where according to your textbooks, there's only one firm, Google, right? Google has basically 100% of the market for search. I mean, it's not really 100%, but when was the last time you binged something to find out where it was or how to do it? Um, not, not very often. So markets, real world markets been, can be characterized according to the conventional wisdom as being either perfectly competitive, oligopolistic, or monopolistic. And according to the conventional analysis, there's some important welfare implications that flow from that and implications for what the government ought to do about it. How many of you have seen a picture like this before? Raise your hands. Yeah, most of you, right? So the, the so-called perfectly competitive firm of economics textbooks, uh, it, you know, uh, there's a, the, the, it's just, this is one firm, you know, one little wheat farmer selling wheat to the wheat market, and there's millions of wheat farmers, so no individual farmer is in a position to, to drive up the price by withholding his wheat or drive down the price by bringing a few extra bushels to market. So these firms are modeled as price takers, quote unquote. 
right? Each firm faces a perfectly elastic demand curve. And if firms choose to maximize their profit by producing where marginal revenue is equal to marginal cost, you get um, uh, the prices and quantities that are given here in this graph in, in equilibrium. And in the long run, right, if, 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 if the market price is high enough that firms are earning economic profits, other firms will come in and drive those profits down by expanding industry output. If firms are making economic losses, they'll begin to exit, and that exit will reduce the supply and help to drive the market price up until you get this long-run equilibrium where everybody's exactly breaking even. Right, so price is not only equal to marginal cost in the short run, short run equilibrium of this model, but in a long run equilibrium, prices are reflected the average cost of production. So this is the most efficient way to distribute resources in society, right? This is the thing that you got for several weeks probably in your intro econ class. But, you know, sinister sounding music now, some markets are not like that because some markets can some firms can have so-called market power, right? What's market power? Well, as I suggested before, it's sort of supposed to sort of capture the ability of a seller to charge a price that's higher than marginal cost, right? Why? Well, because this seller, by definition, is the only seller in the market, right? So, for example, this search engine is the only search engine in the market, so it can charge a very high price for search, Oh, wait a minute, search is free. Um, I gotta go rethink that. Okay, there's a hypothetical monopolist, right, that is the only provider of this product in the market. So, you know, the downward sloping demand curve for the industry is also the downward sloping demand curve for this firm's own output, because it's the only firm in the industry, according to this story. Right, so rather than, rather than the individual firm facing a perfectly elastic horizontal demand curve, it faces a downward sloping demand curve. And so when it charges a price where marginal revenue is equal to marginal cost, it's, uh, right, that's this price. He, uh, sorry, here, the monopoly price is up here, where the marginal cost curve, the blue line, intersects the downward sloping green line, the marginal revenue curve. Right, that gives you the monopolist quantity. And then you go up to the demand curve to find the monopoly price. So the argument is, if this industry were perfectly competitive, like the one on the previous graph, the industry quantity would be QC, and the industry price would be PC. But because only one firm controls the whole industry, that firm can restrict output, deliver less to the market, jack the price way up, all the way up to PM, right? So you get... The firm earns some monopoly profit, but the benefits to consumers are reduced, less so-called consumer surplus, and you've got this, this whole little guy here, the so-called deadweight loss triangle, which is supposed to represent some inefficiency in the market. So you get prices that are too high, outputs that are too low, deadweight loss. This is terrible. We cannot allow this to go on. Right, so what should we do? Well, sometimes the textbooks are a little bit vague on this, but it's, it's implied, if not outright stated, that the, the government either needs to force the firm to charge a lower price, just compel it by law to charge a price that's closer to the so-called competitive price, increase its output, or maybe break it up, right? Use antitrust to split this firm into how many? Well, two, three, five, it's not gonna cut it. It's supposed to have like an infinite number, it's a little bit hard to do in antitrust, but uh, the point is we, the government needs to do something to make this market structure look more like the one on the previous slide. That's what you get in a standard micro course. Well, it turns out, I've sort of hinted to this already, right? even within the framework of neoclassical economics, there are a number of difficulties with the standard kind of so-called market power approach. So one kind of criticism that was offered famously by Joseph Schumpeter, but also by others, is that, look, even if it's true that in the short run you get some kind of allocative inefficiency, some reduction in consumer well-being from having monopoly markets, like the ones on the previous picture, that's kind of the price that we as a society have to pay for innovation. Because remember, the perfectly competitive firm the wheat farmer in this perfectly competitive industry earns zero economic profit, 
right? Gets just enough financial return to cover his opportunity cost, but not a penny more. So that farmer doesn't have any money left over to do anything like research and development, right? Who's going to invent new GMO seeds or GMO-free technologies? Who's going to invent new tractors and, you know, fancy computerized GPS-enabled plowing devices? Who's going to come up use fancy genetics to make Roundup-ready seeds and so forth. Well, the farmers can't do that because they don't have any money. They don't have any retained earnings. They don't have any profit. You, according to Schumpeter, we need to allow some monopolies because monopoly profits can be used for things that are socially beneficial in the long run, like R&D. Okay? Uh, other e uh, mainstream economists, like the great UCLA economist Harold Demsetz, argued that, look, the standard way of looking at it misses one important fact, right? Why is it that Google has a very large share of the search market? Why is it that Netflix has a very large but decreasing share of the market for streaming video? Why is it that, it, why is it that Uber and Lyft have, between them, have most of the market share for ride sharing in the U.S., but not in other countries, right? Well, it's because they're good at it. Because the thing they offer is better than the thing that rivals offer, right? We as consumers prefer to use a Google search. There's no law that prevents us from using anybody else's search technology, but we don't. Most of us don't because we don't like it. We don't like the, the results. It's not as useful. I mean, and of course, notice that in a free market, even, even if one firm has a large market share, nothing prevents consumers from patronizing other firms with smaller market shares. Now, I suspect in a crowd like this, there are at least a few highly paranoid privacy uh, enthusiasts who, you know, don't use Google products or you use DuckDuckGo for your searches because they don't track you. And then that's fine. You can certainly do that, right? But the masses like the convenience of Google. So Demsetz argued if you essentially punish firms for having a large market share by breaking them up or regulating them, then no firms will have an incentive to be large. And how do you get large? By being good by being efficient, having low costs, producing stuff that people want, and we don't, we don't want to penalize success. Um, there was a, back in the 1980s and 90s, there was a, a popular theory that was offered by William Baumol, among others, who was the person I mentioned yesterday with that quote about, about the ghost, the specter haunting economic theory, the missing entrepreneur. Baumol and some of his colleagues pointed out that really what matters or one of the things that matters for determining how competitive a market is, is not the number of firms who are currently in the market, but the number of firms who could easily get into the market if necessary. Right? So, you know, if, if here in Auburn, Alabama, you know, if there's only one firm selling, you know, lemonades or whatever, I don't know if you guys know, there's a famous place down in downtown Auburn called Toomer's Lemonade, Toomer's Drugstore. They sell a famous lemonade. If, if Toomer's is the only place selling lemonade in Auburn and they jack up the price to, you know, $20 a lemonade, well, then it would be in the incentive, it, 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 that would be an incentive for, you know, individuals, companies in Atlanta, in Montgomery, in San Francisco, who knows, from all over the world to converge on Auburn, Alabama and start offering lemonade that's just as good as the Toomer's lemonade at a much lower price, right? So if Toomer's knows, and look, this is lemonade we're talking about. It wouldn't take more than 10 minutes for somebody to come up and set up a competing lemonade operation, okay? Toomer's knows that if it raised prices beyond a certain level, other people would just rush in, and therefore Toomer's doesn't raise the, it doesn't ever do that, but right? it doesn't ever take the action that would trigger these new firms coming in. So the presence of potential com competitors can discipline you know, price, uh, pricing behavior by incumbent firms, even if those potential competitors are not actually in the market yet. They could be in the market. Uh, some uh, economists at the University of Chicago uh, have been in the, in, the, in the econ Twitterverse in the last week or so because they've, they've got a new book coming out called Chicago Price Theory. This is a, like a graduate level text that is supposed to incorporate the contents of the legendary intro microeconomics course at the University of Chicago, um, and they, they, the, some other economists quoted out of context a line from this price theory text where, where the author says something like, well, perfect competition is a reasonable approximation 
in most markets, you know, for doing certain kinds of analysis. And all of these sort of non-Chicago mainstream economists with large numbers of followers started dunking on these people and saying, oh, this is the most idiotic thing ever. Who thinks that real world markets are perfectly competitive? These Chicago guys are out of their minds. Really, all the authors meant was that perfect competition is a useful analytical tool. They weren't making an empirical claim about markets, but they were saying, you know, the standard model uh, of competition is, is okay, even though in reality it doesn't describe real, real markets. Okay, these are perfectly fine criticisms, but they're not fundamental. They don't get at the heart of the problem the way, spoiler alert, the Austrians have done so. Okay, so what are some Austrian critiques of the standard kind of market power approach? Okay, so first let's talk about this idea of the perfectly elastic demand curve the horizontal demand curve versus downward sloping demand curve. Rothbard pointed out in Man, Economy, and State, you know, there is no such thing as a perfectly elastic demand curve. Right? Every seller contributes some discrete quantity of goods and services to the market. Right? Even if doing so doesn't have a huge effect on price, it doesn't have, it doesn't have a zero effect either. Remember, in Austrian causal realist analysis, we don't think of mathematical approximations where we have perfectly smooth and divisible curves, twice differentiable curves, and so forth. We don't think in terms of infinitely large or infinitely small units or periods of time or whatever. We're studying the world of real human action. Human action takes place in discrete increments in real time, right? So uh, in the world of purpose, purposeful human action, uh, there are no infinitesimally small units, and there's no way to have a mathematically perfectly elastic demand curve, right? Anytime a new seller enters the market or anytime a seller brings a new bushel of wheat to market, that has some uh, potential impact on market price. So this whole notion, I mean, all sellers have a downward sloping demand curve. So we can't ex ante say this market is competitive, this market is not competitive just by looking at the shape of the demand curve facing the firm. Okay. Second point, uh, it sounds like a normative point, but it's really just a positive one. Requiring firms with antitrust or regulation to increase output beyond, you know, the profit maximizing point, that so-called monopoly quantity in the traditional monopoly graph, is actually a violation of people's property rights. And therefore, a reduction in social welfare in the meaningful sense that Austrian use, Austrians use terms like social welfare. What do I mean? Well, it's easy to see with an example like the following. I, I looked it up last week. In 20, uh, I guess 2018, the last year for which complete data were available, the highest paid movie star in Hollywood was my doppelganger, George Clooney. <laughs> I forget, for, yeah, I forget the number, but it was a big number. Um, like, but we all know that, you know, it, I guess if you read the tabloids or whatever, I mean, every once in a while, George Clooney is spotted, you know, at the beach or going into a store or hanging out at home or at a party. He's not working making a movie every single moment of every day, right? Obviously, his services are in high demand. So you could argue, well, under perfect competition, Right? The market would demand a higher, a larger quantity of George Clooney films or, or you know, scenes in movies with George Clooney in them, however we measure that, than the one that we actually have. Right? How does George Clooney manage to get you know, 25, 30 million a picture? Because he only does so many pictures a year. He makes himself artificially scarce. Right? If, he, if he were in the studio every single day, if he were in every movie, if he were in every single TV show like you know Samuel L. Jackson, right? His market price would go down because he's sort of super abundant. So you know, any celebrity, entertainer, artist, skilled professional deliberately withholds some of their supply from the market so that they, command a higher, they can command a higher price. That's exactly what the non-competitive you know, producer in the standard model is supposed to be doing, restricting output below the perfectly competitive level to jack up the price. But nobody thinks we could increase social efficiency somehow by compelling George Clooney to work every single moment of every single day. Well, should we compel Jeff Bezos to 
produce more, to offer more Amazon products and services to the market than he is currently offering? I mean, by the same argument, right? Jeff Bezos and his shareholders, the owners of the assets of Amazon.com, are using those assets in a way that, in their minds, is you know they're attempting to maximize their profits. It wouldn't make sense to say, well, they should be they should be compelled to instead of producing QM, they should be compelled to expand output to QC because that will reduce deadweight loss. I mean, that'd be just like saying George Clooney should be forced to make more movies to reduce deadweight loss. It doesn't make any sense. Right? It's a violation of uh, owners' ability to make decisions about how the resources they owned should be used in the highest valued ways. Okay. Another point is that uh, you know, the shape of the demand curve, the el elasticity of the demand curve, which mainstream economists make a big deal about, that is not given by nature, right? You guys, you students know the elasticity of demand rep re reflects the sensitivity of market prices to changes in quantity, right? It represents changes in quantity, how sensitive are, cha are quantities demanded to changes in market prices. That, those are preferences of people in the market. Right, so if consumers want, you know, if, if, if consumers want to make the demand curve more inelastic, they can do so by adjusting their behavior, by changing their willingness to buy or not to buy, depending on the market price. So elasticity of demand is itself an economic concept, not a sort of a technical concept. People say, well, well wait a minute, uh, isn't demand elasticity caused by the availability of substitutes? Right, you know, if, if you're a smoker, you got to have cigarettes. There's no, you know, there's a patch and chewing tobacco and and uh, e the e-cigarettes and all that. Well, those are not a good enough substitute. Therefore, the elasticity of demand uh, is very small for cigarettes. They have very inelastic demand, and therefore, cigarette makers can charge high prices. Well, what things are or are not a good substitute for smoking a cigarette? That is 100% in the minds of cigarette consumers. Okay, they can choose whether something is a substitute or not. That's not a technological concept. That's an economic valuation concept. Okay. Uh, so, uh, as, as I think jo Joe Salerno mentioned in his opening talk on uh, Sunday evening, uh, Mises and Rothbard had slight, a slight difference of interpretation on monopoly theory. I think, I think Joe mentioned this as well, that in, in, in Mises' uh, uh, Understanding it was sort of conceivable that a firm could charge monopoly prices if it had exclusive control of a particular resource or factor, right? So you could imagine a case where there's a single seller of a good or service, or a, or a perfect cartel among sellers of a good or service. And if, according to Mises, if the demand curve is inelastic above the competitive price, the price that would have obtained under other circumstances, then firms can actually charge prices that are different from competitive prices, so-called monopoly prices. Uh, as Joe pointed out, Mises thought that you know, this was, in a sense, a violation of consumer sovereignty. Consumers would prefer a higher quantity on the market. So you know, when Mises talks, as he does in many places, about you know, the, the entrepreneur is not the captain of the ship. The consumer is the captain of the ship. And the, the producers are forced to, forced, c consumer, producers are compelled to try to satisfy the wants of the consumers and so forth. Mises says, well, this is one possible exception where consumer sovereignty does not obtain. But Mises thought this was, in practical terms, very unlikely to occur in a free, unregulated market. Right, because again, what does it mean to be a single seller? I mean, what is or is not a substitute is subjective. Um, cartels are very rare on the market; they typically break apart. So Mises didn't think this was very common, but he did think it was sort of a theoretical theoretical possibility. Rothbard basically accepted Mises' approach to monopoly, but with some refinements. Right, Rothbard, as I suggested before, pointed out that all sellers face a downward sloping demand curve. According to Rothbard, there's really no way praxeologically to distinguish a monopoly price from a competitive price. There are just market prices, okay? All firms are trying to maximize their net income given their estimates of future consumer demand. Uh, 
All firms price in the elastic range of their demand curve, right? They would never price in the inelastic range because if so, they could raise price even more and increase their total revenue, right? And if they're selling less quantity, less quantity, they'd also be lowering their costs. Um, and as we pointed out before, elasticity is sort of the result itself the result of consumer preference. So Rothbard thought that not only is monopoly, as Mises defined it, extremely rare on the free market, it's really not even conceptually distinguishable from any other kind of market phenomenon. So Rothbard rejected the idea of monopoly prices as things distinct from competitive prices. There are only prices on the market, according to Rothbard. And of course, in Rothbard's view, as many of you knew, uh, no, he, he, he accepted the common law notion of monopoly as an exclusive government grant, right? So, you know, in some cases, that could be like the post office. It's illegal for anybody else to send a letter or use a postal mailbox uh, or the, the East India Company, like I mentioned before. But monopoly, government granted monopoly is also reflected in patents, right? A patent grants the patent holder a fixed term exclusive license to use that technology or produce that product. There can be all kinds of grants and charters and licenses, even tariffs and quotas, other kinds of trade protectionism, et cetera, give some de facto monopoly protection to domestic firms because they don't have to compete against foreign firms and so forth. So what do the Austrians say about these sort of you know, proposed regulatory and antitrust solutions to monopoly issues? Um, as I mentioned before, in the, in the standard approach, in the mainstream neoclassical approach, there's sort of two possible remedies that the government should use to deal with the problem of monopoly prices. One is to use regulation, right? Just pass a law that says the price cannot be higher than X, right? So you could try to force the monopolist to lower the price that it's charging to something closer to the actual marginal cost, right? Just, you know, pass a law. Uh, you know, two obvious problems with this approach. I mean, first of all, it's easy to draw a silly diagram like your professors do and your textbooks do and say, oh yeah, where these lines cross right here, that's what the price should be. Okay, but remember demand curves, mar marginal revenue curves, marginal cost curves are not, they don't exist in reality. Those are abstractions constructed by the analyst I mean, firms don't know what their actual marginal revenue curve is. They can, they can estimate. They can estimate their marginal cost curves. Right? How in the world is some government regulator going to know how the price that we actually observe on the market compares to some hypothetical pure monopoly price, some hypothetical perfectly competitive price, some intermediate oligopoly price? There's no way that even a well-intentioned government regulator could possibly know what the right prices are, okay? Moreover, why would these regulators have an incentive to, to get the prices right? Okay, as, uh, as Harold Demsetz, who I mentioned before, and, and, and Ronald Coase often emphasized, you know, the textbooks usually have page after page, chapter after chapter on so-called market failure, like monopoly, for example, and they don't, you know, they probably don't devote a single page to government failure, right? I mean, the regulator is going to get things wrong. The regulator could be corrupt. The regulator has a short time horizon. Uh, the regulator can easily be bought off. Regulators can be captured by the industries they're supposed to regulate, and so on, and so on, and so forth, right? So, in other words, even from a neoclassical economics perspective, even if you thought monopoly prices were somehow harmful, you might think that setting up a super powerful government entity with the right to tell firms how to price or the ability to take a firm and break it up into pieces would be even worse than just allowing monopoly prices to, to, to prevail, okay? You can't compare the real world market against some stylized, <laughs> hypothetical benchmark like perfect competition, unless you're also going to compare the real world regulator to this hypothetical perfect benevolent regulator in the textbooks. Okay, but hardly anyone in the mainstream ever does that. So again, second approach, instead of using price regulation, is just to use some kind of antitrust, right? So in the US, you have the Sherman Act and subsequent pieces of legislation that outlaw certain things that are not very precisely defined. Okay, 
The Sherman Act outlaws restraints on trade. Now it's been up to the courts, including uh, on and up to the Supreme Court, to define what constitutes a restraint on trade because it's not completely obvious. There are other practices like so-called price discrimination, charging different prices to different buyers, so-called tying, you know, telling the buyer if you buy my product A, you've got to buy my product B that goes with it, uh, which have also been restricted or, or completely banned by other acts like the, the other legislation like the Clayton Act, laws that specifically deal with so-called predatory pricing and so forth. Uh, in the European Union, competition policy is a little bit more aggressive than it is in the US, but based on, founded on the same general principles and certainly in most parts of the world, you have a so-called competition authority, the job of which is to police the market and make sure markets are competitive in the neoclassical sense, using in particular antitrust policy and, and similar kinds of remedies. Um, as I mentioned to you guys before, you know, when I, when I was in school, Back in the 80s and 90s, you know, what I learned was, oh yeah, people were really concerned about monopoly pricing and, you know, aggressive and antitrust was really aggressive in the early 20th century to bust up these evil monopolies and so forth. But you know, now markets are pretty competitive and antitrust doesn't have that much to do anymore. That in the last, I'd say, even even within just the last decade, maybe two decades, there's been a radical change in how mainstream economists and legal scholars think about antitrust. So back in the, I don't know, from say the 1940s to the 1970s or 80s, the dominant theoretical paradigm in the analysis of antitrust was something called the structure conduct performance paradigm or SCP paradigm, which held that, uh, you know, you can look at the structure of any market count the number of firms or look at the market shares of the biggest firms and therefore deduce whether that market is in fact competitive. If the market has the wrong market structure, it's too heavily concentrated, then the conduct of those firms will be, uh, you know, they'll charge higher prices than they're supposed to. And then the performance in that market for consumers, for the economy is going to be weak. And so antitrust needs to look basically at market structure you know, concentration indexes. Some of you have heard of the famous Herfindahl Index of Concentration. That basically the antitrust authority's job is to measure Herfind the Herfindahl Index in different industries and then recommend antitrust breakups with the Herfindahl Index is too high. Okay. That view really kind of intellectually was severely challenged in the 70s and 80s and kind of fell out of favor. There was Oliver Williamson's transaction cost approach to uh, market structure, which held that many practices, both in terms of sort of horizontal market share and vertical integration, that deviate from the perfectly competitive model are not in fact harmful and, and welfare reducing, but are actually welfare enhancing because they promote more efficient coordination among firms and between firms. They allow us to produce things more efficiently and actually make prices lower than they otherwise would be an in increased consumer well-being. And of course, there was the Chicago School, 60s, 70s, and 80s, associated most famously with people like Robert Bork, who was nominated for the Supreme Court in sometime in the mid-80s, and in a famous, probably one of, one of the first sort of really vicious Senate confirmation hearings, was, was turned down by the Senate, uh, uh, by the whatever committee it is, uh, for a position on the Supreme Court Judiciary Committee. Uh, and that, that gave us the, the verb to bork, to bork someone. It's kind of like, and nowadays, you, in your generation, you have words like, you know, you have new verbs like dox, like to dox somebody or gaslight somebody. Back in the 80s, we talked about borking someone. To bork someone means basically to attack them viciously in some kind of political process in a way that's not really fair. Right, so Bork was criticized for a lot of things that were not even remotely close to his actual views. Um, but the idea was that the Chicago School had challenged the ideas of the old structure conduct performance paradigm, like some of the things I said before, that potential competition may be as effective as actual competition, that large market share may reflect superior efficiency rather than some kind of devious manipulation of the market, and that therefore antitrust courts should have a presumption in favor of 
you know, the defendants. In other words, it's, it should be pretty obvious that some kind of anti-competitive conduct has taken place for the Justice Department or the plaintiff to win. We should have a presumption in favor of competition, and only in very rare cases should we accept that markets are actually uh, imperfectly uh, competitive or that they're sufficiently imperfectly competitive that antitrust should be used. Um, in the 90s and 2000s, uh, the theory of antitrust and regulation, the whole theory of market structure, was sort of revolutionized by game theory. So how many of you had a course where they talked about duopoly or oligopoly using the prisoner's dilemma or some kind of a game theoretic model? A lot of you. So the game theoretic approach was sometimes called post-Chicago, not only because it was developed later than the Chicago School, but also because it challenged many of the conclusions of the Chicago School. And so-called post-Chicago antitrust, game theoretic antitrust, is, is much more friendly towards aggressive antitrust. Nowadays, something has emerged that is sometimes called hipster antitrust or neo-Brandeisian antitrust after the famous Supreme Court just, uh, Justice uh, Louis Brandeis, who was very favorable to strong antitrust. Uh, there's a, um, well, uh, an activist, I would say, like a nonprofit journalist activist uh, person named Lena Kahn, who wrote a, a law review piece, I think it was two years ago, it's called, um, uh, it's something like uh, Antitrust in a Post-Amazon World. Making, this is, this is where Elizabeth Warren gets her argument, right? So the so-called hipster neo-Brandeisians say, all of that stuff about antitrust in the old era doesn't really apply anymore. Because, you know, as I mentioned with Google, remember the, the conventional argument has always been, uh, well, monopoly is bad because they restrict output and charge higher prices. Okay, well, what does Amazon do? Charge lower prices for everything than you, could, than, than you could get anywhere else. Google gives away almost all of its products for free. You know, that Facebook subscription that gets on your nerves because they keep changing the privacy policy or whatever. How much do you pay for your Facebook account? Right, so you can't argue that firms with large market shares in the tech sector are exploiting their market share by raising prices because they're not. They give all their stuff away for free or they charge prices lower than the incumbents. So Lena Kahn and other antitrust scholars have said, well, we need a whole new way to look at it, that these firms are, are anti-competitive because, well, uh, you know, here, here's the kind of argument you hear. Uh, Amazon, and as you guys probably know, Amazon's biggest revenue source is not the commissions that it charges on stuff that you buy and sell on Amazon.com. It's what it, the money it makes from Amazon Web Services its back office sort of web hosting operation. So the argument is, well, these large tech platforms, they charge higher prices to other companies in the wholesale market than they otherwise would. And they engage in this pretty aggressive practice, practice of buying up competitors. If some little firm comes along and it has something that facilitates e-commerce or web services, Amazon will just buy it up. And they've got huge cash hoards. You know, Apple has, what, a billion dollars in cash sitting in the bank. They can just buy up any firms that threaten their market position. And yeah, even though they don't raise prices, it's still harmful in the long run because they're holding back innovation or they're hurting workers or they're hurting some kind of intermediate goods firms and so forth. Therefore, we still need to break them up. Okay, so that is the zeitgeist today. Um, and that's where you get most of the competition programs. Well, not only of the Democratic candidates, but the, the Republican economists and, and uh, Congress people who are attacking Twitter and Facebook and so forth based on content issues are also making these same kind of claims. Everybody in Washington wants Facebook, Google, Amazon, maybe Apple, et cetera, split, broken up, okay? There are lots and lots of problems in practice with doing competition policy. I'll just hint at a few. Um, first of all, you know, what is the relevant market? Is the market uh, for, you know, for Colgate toothpaste, is the relevant market Colgate, in which Colgate has a 100% monopoly? Or is the market toothpaste, in which its market share is smaller? Is the market consumer health and beauty products? in which its market share is even smaller? 
right? Is the market for Amazon other online big retailers? Does it include Walmart or not? Is it international or is it domestic? So there's no way objectively to say what is the relevant market that we use to compute the market share. Um, one, of the, one of the most famous uh, antitrust cases in the 20th century was called Brown Shoe. You can look it up where Brown Shoe was a national retailer of shoes that had like a chain. They had a store in every town. Uh, the Justice Department, they wanted to buy another shoe company, another national chain, Kinney, and the Justice Department intervened to try to block the merger. And uh, Brown Shoe argued that the relevant market is, uh, the, is the local town, right? So, so the Justice Department said, well, if we allow these two national chains to merge, then there will be only one big national chain. That's not competitive. And Brown Shoe said, no, the relevant market is, the, is Auburn, Alabama, or whatever town, if you know, and if Brown Shoe is competing with small local shoe stores in Auburn, Alabama, then it faces competition. The competition is the local market. The relevant market is the local market, not the national market. Um, the Supreme Court argued in favor of the government and not in favor of Brown Shoe. Uh, how do we know when contact, conduct is really anti-competitive? If you can't look at prices, you got to come up with these highly speculative, speculative counterfactuals, like the one I just mentioned about Amazon. Well, if it weren't for Amazon, we would have had more innovation in web services and in retail, and we would have gotten even better stuff than we now have. Yeah, okay, I guess. I can imagine a world in which that is true. I can imagine worlds in which a lot of other things are true. Is that a basis for throwing somebody in jail, right, or forcing them to divest their holdings or break up their company doesn't seem like it. Um, you know, you want to take a dynamic rather than a static view. Uh, a lot of firms, right, remember firms can file a civil antitrust suit. So firm A can file an antitrust suit against firm B for engaging in monopolistic conduct. Guess what? It's a great opportunity for firm A to engage, you know, to use the political process to hurt its rival right, to waste its rival's time, spend a lot of its rival's money defending itself in court. So there are a lot of opportunities for rent seeking. Um, can the government really keep up with changes in the market? There's a famous uh, book from the 1980s about the uh, US government's attempt to break up IBM in the 60s. Uh, the book's called Folded, Spindled, and Mutilated, which some of you old timers will recognize that term. But uh, basically what happened is the IBM was alleged to have monopolized the market for computer mainframes. And the Justice Department began what turned out to be something like a 10-year investigation. You know, judicial proceedings are slow. And at some point, 10 years later, the prosecutors finally realized, oh, the, the thing that we claimed IBM had a monopoly in, the mainframe, doesn't exist anymore. Because now people use PCs and other devices, so let's just drop the whole thing. Right? The market disciplines so-called anti-competitive conduct much more quickly than bureaucracy. And of course, the problem is you can't define anti-competitive conduct ex ante. So if you're a firm, you don't really know if you've engaged in anti-competitive behavior until you get a subpoena in the mail. And so it's basically punishing behavior ex post that you couldn't have known about ex ante, and that's obviously inefficient. Okay. Um, uh, I did have a little piece I was going to say about minimum wages, but I'll defer that to Mark Thornton, who's giving a minimum wage lecture later. But I'll just mention that there's a parallel argument on monopoly pricing that applies to input markets that's called uh, monopsony. And it turns out nowadays that most of the arguments in favor of minimum wages are not the traditional ones. They're about this kind of stuff. They say that large firms have monopsony power. They have, bar they have buying power in the labor market. And they use that monopsony power to push wages down. And therefore, the government needs to intervene to make wages higher and get them closer to their competitive levels. But you can ask Mark Thornton about that during and after his lecture. So thanks very much. Thank you.